David Mason, the Director of Public Health for the Town of Sandwich, and we are doing PSA number six, second year, and it is April 16th, Friday. Uh, we've had a little snow in New England uh, for April, and we're going to start off our PSA this week, as usual, with Chief Burke for an update on what we have going on in the community. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, as of today, April 16th, uh, 32 active cases, which is good news. We were hovering in the 70s for a period of time, so we've come down to 32. Hospitalizations are in the 20s. I don't have the exact update today, but they are down from what they previously were. Um, so hopefully we are gonna be trending in the right direction here with the uh, 30 or so cases. I have noticed over the last week that the numbers have gone down um, with the active uh, cases that we're being notified of. So you know, hopefully uh, with the warm weather and people getting outside, the vaccines getting distributed will be uh, headed in the right direction. Very good, yeah, it's quite a, quite a decline in a short amount of time. I, I think we expected to have higher rate, the elevated rate going into the April school vacation and then right. dealing with that, but we'll see what the fallout of that is after the April vacation. And uh, do you have any news on updates on testing that we've? Yep, so speaking of April vacation, uh, Dave and the staff secured the state to come April the 28th, stop the spread event. Uh, we did it earlier this month from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Human Services Building. Uh, it's a nasal PCR test with a 24, roughly a 24 to 48 hour turnaround time. So we encourage anybody that is symptomatic or has been exposed uh, to come through. Again, it's free and it'll be at Human Services from 2 to 6 on the 28th of April and we'll heavily advertise that. Um, on the local end here, we've been testing our school employees uh, weekly. Uh, averaging 200 tests a week just with school employees. We have school vacation coming up, so there'll be a break there. We're gonna use the Stop the Spread event as the testing for that week of the 26th, and then we'll re-engage the following week, pretty much through the month of May, I think is my plan now. We have enough test kits to do that, so we're staying on top of things. Um, fire department staff, municipal staff are still being tested. We have town meeting coming up, so I did offer to Taylor White for the election staff that are working both town meeting and the elections, both pre and post uh, event testing. So those that are working town meeting, uh, if they wanna be tested before or after or both, they can do that. And same thing with the election polls, uh, which is a shortened amount. I think we talked about that. It's from 10 to, 10 to six or 10 to seven, uh, but they'd be more than welcome to be tested the following day or day after. Um, for election employees. So we're, our testing is going well, we're being consistent, we are mixing in some antibody testing also to see the vaccine efficacy if it's working uh, with our employees and we are getting positive results uh, with that. Um, I will say that the average time that we are seeing uh, initial antibody production post vaccine, the first shot, uh, Moderna was an average of uh, day 12. So first shot, day 12, we were seeing uh, antibodies being produced with our testing. Pfizer was around day 14. Interestingly enough, the J&J &J vaccine, which we know at the moment has been put on pause, uh, was about day 28. So uh, again, it's a one shot, uh, shot, but we were seeing antibody production right around day 28 with that. So. We're working on some other stuff that I'm not gonna disclose right now that'll probably be coming in the next couple months with testing as we can constantly try to improve. Uh, but we're working on a few things that we're hoping for approval from uh, FDA to be able to put into play for longer term surveillance testing for our municipal employees and school employees. Let's, um, the, you had mentioned the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine and that being paused. You know, we were up, uh, made aware of that and updated based on uh, the number of issues that had arisen and types of issues, and we're all fully aware of that. So those of you who had had the J&J &J vaccine, you know, it's it, it, good to reach out if you feel there's some issues to your primary care physician, and uh, we're available for uh, assistance on that also. But I wanna kind of put that in perspective too, for those who have not had a vaccination, if J&J, &J, uh, you know, if the pause is lifted on uh, the Johnson & Johnson, I was watching TV last night, and the number of drug ads on TV is astounding. Yes. And, you know, when they were listing off, you know, when they had the drug ad, they would list off the potential side effects. Yep. Uh, uh, and the length of side effects on these goes for about 30 seconds, it seems. And when you 
talk about this J and J, that's mm -hmm. why I kind of want to put it in perspective. Everything we utilize in some drug format has some side effect. There's a risk associated at some point in time. They've decided to put it on hold. It doesn't mean the vaccine is bad. They want to have a better understanding of, of what's occurring and what's operating and how to address that issue. Because in many of the cases, they're already seeing how best to address what they're seeing Correct. at this point. Any thoughts on that, Chief? I think it's interesting when you look at the, well, the targeted six that they were looking at were all female aged 18 to 48. So is there something within that age group that is gender specific that they're seeing as an issue? Um, but I think a lot of things get put on pause. And, and just for our safety's sake, and we operate under safety protocols with my day-to-day -day job here, we always err on the side of caution. I think a two-week pause is not a lot um, to ask. I know many people have gotten the J&J &J vaccine and have been fine, but let them investigate it, make sure it's clear, and then put it, uh, you know, put it back into play. Because this is a valuable commodity, a one-shot. Uh, we were utilizing it for our homebound folks. And, uh, and you know, I think just be patient. There are going to be little, little blips on the radar. And, um, you know, it's one of three. The fourth vaccine, Novavax, is coming. That's a two-shot. Yep. AstraZeneca is being used in Europe. Uh, that has not been approved here yet. Uh, so we could have five or six different vaccines uh, you know, hitting the market here in the next 90 days that really change the landscape of uh, the vaccine options that are available, but also the, you know, the amount of vaccines we can get out there to people to try to tamp down the virus. And again, just don't dismiss it on the basis of some issues. Everything that you take has some potential percent of risk associated with side effects from death to cancer, if you listen to them all. So, you know, if once it's put out there again, as far as being safe, don't dismiss it yep. I mean, as far as what we've seen. We're talking six cases out of millions that have uh, doses administered thus far. Uh, just as far as to follow up also uh, with regards to, uh, I know there's been a lot of talk about potential booster shots out there because of the variants that are out there. And just to, just to keep in mind also that every year that you get your flu shot, there is actually an H1N1 booster in that because your flu shots are made up of multiple uh, potential uh, strains, right? strains yep. that you need to address. And H1N1 has been in it since the start of H1N1. So, you know, this whole idea of a booster is not unusual either because, you know, it, it, the way it comes across or people are playing it is like it's a... Uh, it's, it's that there's an issue with the vaccine, that it wasn't enough, that right. it wasn't enough research. And that's not the case. I mean, as far as we're aware of that, because we see what comes through and we're familiar with it. But just, you know, just a couple of those things, just to put it in perspective where you're at. The, uh, we had talked this morning also, as far as we are seeing the variants of the B117 and the P1, and that's the UK variant and the Brazilian variant. And uh, just to be aware to take extra precautions uh, because we, you know, as far as the numbers we saw, you know, we're still seeing some. Granted, they're on the decline, but please be aware of that also. And then uh, another thought, too, we're getting a lot of calls of cases on how to deal with once you've been vaccinated. Yep. You've been in direct contact someone that's positive and then you've been vaccinated. So, I mean, as far as... We'll be dealing with those situations on calls, you know, that the chief goes on and, you know, people are seeing, uh, seeing that occurring in their businesses that, you know, if you're fully vaccinated the two weeks out after your vaccination period, you know, you're no longer considered a direct contact at that time. Uh, so you, you don't have to quarantine per the protocol. And just to add to that, so our employees have been, uh, second shots were given in February. So we've been exposed to right. multiple, uh, hundreds is probably within reason, uh, COVID patients with our vaccinated staff that have not had to quarantine. We have tested them because we have the ability to aggressively test them and we have not come up with a positive. And I'm literally talking, some groups were taking back uh, a couple weeks ago, three or four positive patients a day fully vaccinated um, in the back of an ambulance for 20, 25 minutes in a confined area. They did have their masks on, the patient had the mask on, but again, that's a tight space. Uh, 
with the expo technically it would have been deemed an exposure right and uh but they were vaccinated we monitored them and and uh, we've had no positives with that so i think that's good anecdotal evidence it's not you know it's a exactly. small sample size but uh i can say as an administrator that um, we have not had to put people out into quarantine or they've been COVID positive after the vaccine so far no break no breakthrough cases at the fire department so far and hence why police and fire were vaccinated and you know up front before everyone else yep. in anticipation of this yep uh the the um we spoke this mor morning also the cdc came out because as far as i had spoken last week that you know there's uh, that nine people stating that 98 percent of the people recover from this and i had uh, brought up well keep in mind of that 98 percent there's those long haulers and there's a couple interesting points on that one, the CDC came up with a study that approximately one third of those people uh, that uh, had recovered of that 98% do have uh, long hauler symptoms. But with that, there's some new studies that have come out. We spoke of it this morning relative to the vaccine. You want to speak to that, Chief? There are uh, two cases. One where if you are a COVID long hauler and you get the vaccine, they're seeing symptom reversal fairly quickly. So those long hauler symptoms are basically self-correcting after the administration of the vaccine. So I, I think that's interesting because as you remember when the vaccine rollout first started, if people that were COVID positive were like, I'm gonna wait, right. make sure right. everybody can get their, their vaccine. And some of those people were long haulers with significant symptoms. And uh, since receiving the vaccine, they've reported a reversal in those long hauler symptoms. So that's positive news there, I think. Uh, not that it's going to be for everybody, but I think the fact that there's enough information out there that they're putting it into a study and, and releasing it, I think, is important. It is, and that's you know, and that's why we want to bring it up because as far as if those people out there, those long haulers, that are concerned about you know, one, they've already been experiencing this, they've heard about concerns about the vaccination relative to how how it could possibly make you feel after the fact mm -hmm. is that you know you may want to talk to your primary care physician because there may be a benefit to this and that's what you know why we want to bring this up and it was discussed this morning in our in our covid group meeting so you know reach out to your primary care physician if you're if you're questioning that and if you are a long hauler uh it may be worth your while to do that and then as far as uh just speaking to of uh as far as uh, your crew at the at the station chief as far as the cdc came through also with um for those who have been vaccinated uh the breakthrough infection rate is approximately seven percent that they're seeing and seven percent is pretty small you know right. considering so you know as far as what we may see on any given day but that's why your crew still follows mass up also. Yep, so. and I think the, the thing with breakthrough infections in public safety that's interesting is a couple of breakthrough infections I'm aware of in public safety were because the spouse was positive and they were basically exposed for large amounts of time to, you know, feeling vaccinated that they didn't have to have that separation, um, that they did turn positive. The symptoms were almost negligible at, you know, right. with the people, but um, that it can happen and, and, and breakthrough infections can happen. And that's why, again, I think we said this a couple of weeks ago, our testing posture is through January of next year. Right. We're gonna have the ability, not that we're gonna use it all the time, not that we may necessarily need it, but those small amounts of time when, you know, we're gonna need it, we'll have it. And one of our hopes coming up in the next couple of months is that we can take our testing abilities into the ambulance it seems like that should be a no-brainer, but there are procedures we have to go through. But if we have somebody that is symptomatic, uh, we can swab them right in the driveway, and then it's a 15, 20-minute transport time to the hospital. We'll have an initial rapid result for the hospital before the people even get inside the building. So, you know, that's one of the things we're looking to uh, to also utilize uh, in the back of the ambulance. It's going to take a little bit of time. Like I said, it should be a no-brainer. Uh, but these there's policies and procedures we have to follow with the state to get approval for that but that's one of the directions we're looking to go yep. so even if you know if you end up having a call with the rescue uh as far as to, and and having uh chief's uh crew come to your house mask up ahead of time you yep. know just out of courtesy for that just have be aware of that and granted that seven percent on you know is low based on the volume of numbers of vaccinated people 
it's still, you know, just be considerate of that and aware of that. It's not zero, is what I tell people. It's not zero, correct. Not zero. So, you know, the, um, and just so I guess, do we have anything else, Chief? Because I guess we'll wrap up just. Oh, I think we, uh, town meetings ago for the 3rd of May. Oh, let's, uh, let's, you know, speak to that then too. Uh, town meeting and the election. So people should expect uh, basically what they've seen in place already? Correct. So last year, it's a repeat of last year, town meeting in the gymnasium at the high school is the primary with the overflow in the auditorium. Uh, the election setup will be exactly the same. In fact, we can probably rerun Taylor's video from last year right. of the voting precincts because it's pretty much going to be the same setup. Uh, and again, town meeting will be the same. So we're, we're definitely prepared and ready to go. The extra layer this year, we have testing capability for those workers. That'll and we had no cases associated after the last two rounds based on how it was set up. Uh, we will, will ask that you wear masks when you're present. If you wish to speak at town meeting, you can remove the mask at that time when you're at the mic, but otherwise everybody will be uh, separated and masked at that point. Perfect. And uh, so again, just a reminder, Chief spoke to the Stop the Spread event on the 28th. It will be from 2 to 6 at the Human Ser Services Building on Quaker Meeting House Road as a drive through uh, Please come out and take advantage of that situation. It's a free test as Chief had mentioned. Uh, and as far as the, oh, there was one more point I was going to make, but I guess I'm going to, I'm going to lose my thought here. No, we have another week. We have another week. We'll stop so, the spread of that. Yes, so <laughs> the, before, exactly. So we will wrap up with that. And oh, one other, I did remember that. Yeah. We'll have the uh, COVID hotline number posted. Uh, for people, if again, if you're interested in getting a vaccine, if you've been hesitant, um, we, the town has been submitting the uh, numbers, your name and phone number uh, to Cape Cod Healthcare, and people are seeing a call within 20 minutes to two hours to schedule. So it's a pretty easy if you've gotten frustrated with some other means, call that COVID hotline. You'll speak to the library staff who have been doing a great job. They'll get your information and it will be passed on and forwarded and we'll get you in pretty quick. Perfect. So I think that's it. Very good. Well, take care, uh, be safe, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Thank you.